This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner. And this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey. So tell me, Muse, of that plant of many resources, which wandered far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, and fiber, cultivated for millennia. As we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives, the many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, cannabis in religion, cannabis in medicine, and cannabis in Uncle Sam over there. And thus our odyssey begins. Today our odyssey is not long ago and far away. It is current and in progress. It is the needless age-old dance with Uncle Sam. Is the current drug policy protecting our children from harmful drugs? Is putting people in prison really solving our drug problem? Especially for an ounce of marijuana, taking up space when violent criminals don't have room for in the prison? Eh. Is prohibition any more effective now than it was in the 20s? Over-criminalization and over-incarceration combining with equal enforcement, does it do more harm than good? There's a growing nationwide consensus that the law enforcement approach doesn't work. Meanwhile, the exploration of alternative approaches have been hampered by misinformation, absence of intelligent debate, and our guest today is Carl Berkowist, I hope I got that right, Executive Director, the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization that's been with us since 1993. And they have worked to deal with these very questions, to minimalize the, the, this whole nonsense about the misinformation, what the federal government has told us, which is a total lie, and working with the people of Hawaii to get d decent, normal approaches to cannabis. And so, Carl? Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. And, and talk to me, talk to me about this whole nonsense, especially now that our um, Attorney General Sessions is trying to turn back the clock of all the progress that our state and other states have made in medical marijuana, and some of them in uh, socialized marijuana. They've, they've created industries, whole industries around cannabis. Now they want to turn it back. Talk to me. Tell me. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you, Marcia. Thank you for, for having me and for the Drug Policy Forum as well. Um, yes, I think right now, th this moment in time, we need to focus on both the federal government, represented in this case by Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Um, he is a long time, what we call a drug warrior. He is the proponent of the war on drugs. And when he was in the Senate, that was one of his big issues. He has two issues, anti-drugs, anti lock people up for drug use, particularly cannabis, which he he says that only bad, he doesn't know any good people that use cannabis. So that's one of his big issues. I might add that he's from Alabama, a real died in the wool racist. And, and he equates drugs with minorities. Absolutely, absolutely. He, you know, I'm, so I represent a 501c3, so we don't take a lot of political stances, but when, when it comes to this issue, um, he is a representation of the war on drugs, and the war on, and he is. He admits that he is. He likes the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. He wants to continue it. He wants to escalate it, 
and the war on drugs over time has been shown to be a war on communities of color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you put one and one together and you see what he's up to. And his most recently, he's tried to change the, the guidelines that President Obama put out to sort of stop targeting people for minor offenses when it comes to drugs. Uh, President Obama and his attorneys general, uh, first uh, Eric Holder and then Loretta Lynch, they began to kind of right the ship a little bit. Um, there were some data released from the FBI just yesterday or two days ago showing that in 2016, under President Obama, we hadn't seen as much progress as we would like. But um, a lot of the, the nationwide arrests when it comes to cannabis are done by state and localities, like police in Alabama. Yes. So when you have the highest law enforcement officer of the land, uh, Jeff Sessions in this case, sending a totally different signal than, than President Obama, they're going to be emboldened. Mm -hmm. We saw an increase from 2015 to 2016 in cannabis arrests nationwide. And now we have an attorney general who's not saying, let's not do that. That's not our focus. That's not our priority. That's not important. Uh, we shouldn't lock people up for something that is not detrimental to their health. We, and I mean, locking people up for something that's not detrimental to their health and then having them become criminalized inside the, the, the mass incarceration system, it creates a problem when there wasn't one to begin with. So we are very concerned about these signals being sent and how this is going to change over time. It's already bad enough, but it looks like it's going to be getting worse. Now, how does that, how does his presence as Attorney General affect where we are in the state of Hawaii. I, since 2000 when the bill passed until now, it seems mm. like they're dragging their feet. It, you know, people have a card that says that they have a condition that they can be treated with medical cannabis. Yet, there's no place to buy it. They say, oh, well, you can grow Ten plants at home. Mm -hmm. Where do I get ten plants? Where do I get seeds? How do I grow? I don't know anything. I'm not a farmer. I don't know how to grow. No, exactly. No, no, this is this is ludicrous. And I, I think that, you know, what we don't want is our local politicians who, as you point out, 17 years ago, recognized the beneficial use of medical cannabis for patients who are suffering. And over the years, we have increased the number of conditions that patients might have to get treatment. Most recently, PTSD oh, that for would, our, for that, that our veterans. That should go to the top. That should yeah. go to the top, yes. And before 2015, patients with that condition could not be treated with medical cannabis legally. Now we have over 1,200 people in the state being treated legally. And there's, I'm sure there's many more that are going to come out of the woodworks once, as you point out, that they can actually just go buy the medicine rather than that, grow it. Right. And so, yeah. And the Attorney General, I think, and just to answer your question about the Attorney General, he's, the signal he sends is he's trying to, to, to stoke up fear and reluctance among states to not only improve the medical cannabis system, sort of saying, well, I'm not so focused on medical cannabis, I'm more concerned about the recreational cannabis, but if you don't do your medical cannabis well, I might come after you as well. So he's sort of like putting this uncertainty out there and I hope that our politicians, um, you know, they, they will continue to stand up for what's right for our citizens, our residents, our patients, and improve this system and not use that as an excuse to do nothing. Well, I noticed that since 2000, the numbers of our local politicians, almost to a person, have supported this industry. The governor is totally on board. So, and, and I'm sure our Doug Chin, our attorney general. Um, so, how do they stand up to sessions? Well, I mean, we except our health department. <laughs> well, so so so, you know, if if you look outside the the drug policy realm for a second, Hawaii has been standing up to this president when it believes he's wrong. And the most prominent example is the, the Muslim ban. Yes. 
And that's an ongoing battle. It's been going on for basically since this administration started. So I think what we've been advocating is that, uh, you know, be consistent. Be, if you're in favor of one policy, make sure you stand up for that against the president and his attorney general. And I think um, you're right that the governor has been supportive, the legislators have been supportive, and they do stand up for it. But I'm, I'm, we are concerned that they're um, sometimes too cautious. So, you know, we, we have a medical cannabis system that uh, is very regulated and sometimes to the point of making access for patients problematic. And, and, you know, we want to see if we can loosen that up. We only have eight licenses in the state right now and we only have two dispensaries open. And the patients on the big island, the island with the most patients, uh, over 5,000, have no dispensaries open and none, you know, there's no prospect of them opening within six months. Well, okay, so would they have to fly over here to go to the dispensary? So there's a, that's a... Is that an issue? I mean, yeah, that's, 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 that is a, that's a good point. Of course, that is absurd that they would have to do that. But not only uh, are we putting them in the position of, you know, let's say they can't grow on their own, we well, have to fly to Oahu or Maui, where the other open dispensary is. We also put a needless prohibition on their traveling with the medicine. I was going to say back. that was my question. Yeah, how so do you travel? So unfortunately, our state law, in the and this this happened under uh, President Obama actually when he was in power. Um, our legislators and the governor have been so careful to say we got to create a very regulated system so as not to incur the wrath of the federal government. And so that's why they're very cautious. And one of the things they put into the, the dispensary law was you cannot travel with your medicine between islands. There's this explicit prohibition. And that's a very unusual prohibition because in other states, there's no such prohibition. Well, if you buy your medicine in one end of uh, Arkansas, you can travel to the other end of Arkansas. But the, the issue, and I don't know because I haven't read the, the bill, issue is traveling over open ocean. Sure, over federal waters. Over federal waters. So that's, th to that's, me, that's the issue. That's what they, that's what they say. So when patients within uh, Oregon fly within Oregon, they fly within Oregon with their medicine or recreational cannabis, they go through TSA. If TSA finds cannabis on those individuals, they call local law enforcement. Oh. They say local, local law enforcement, is this person in compliance with state law? In most cases, they are. They either have a medical have cannabis card, card yeah. or they have an, other, an amount for personal use. They can, they can fly within Oregon. But so that's not federal, that's still Oregon. It is within Oregon. That's but, within Oregon. Sure, but, but it does here, go through this federal agency yeah, there. But which the is, idea that we have to cross the ocean. Sure. But again, you know, that, we that's are... That's absurd. It, Exactly. There, there, there is no other option. That's the geography of our state. And we are just talking about patients traveling with minimal amounts of medicine. So, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to advocate for changing. We think that is a needless prohibition. And the idea that changing the law would incur the wrath of Jeff Sessions is sort of uh, overplaying things, I think. Oh, yeah, well, I'm sure. But he's got enough to deal with otherwise. I, I would hope that he would look, not even know we're here. Isn't that what they said about some island? In, yeah, in, some, yeah, some judge some, on an island in the, in the Pacific, Pacific, right? Yes, yeah. No, and they haven't, they haven't, just to be clear, they haven't set a policy on the adult use, the recreational use of cannabis mm -hmm. yet. They're looking at that, and you know, all estimates are that that's what they would target. They would go after Colorado and Washington. But as you pointed out earlier, that is, that's a growing industry, and to target that seems also very, very problematic for okay. the federal government. So we'll see what happens, but I'm not, I know that our legislators are concerned, and they, they don't like to hear me say that, but I'm not as concerned. Okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back, let's talk about what an industry, because Hawaii needs a new industry, so let's talk about it. Sure. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. And we are back, and we have Carl Bergquist. Okay, I'll get it right. Carl is from the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. And they do all kind of wonderful things. And Carl was just telling me about this whole nonsense of who is targeted for an ounce of marijuana. So, yeah. So. So our, in our state, the, uh, when it comes to cannabis arrests, we're actually seeing a couple of different trends. Um, it's been pretty stable at about 800 arrests a year for adults. It seems to be going down. For juveniles, it's about 400 a year, but actually went up quite a bit from 2015 to 2016. So we'll see if that, if that continues. And the problem with these numbers is the, the disparate impact on communities of color. Now on the mainland, uh, we see that mainly for African Americans and Latinos who are three to four times more likely to be arrested despite using cannabis at the same rate as uh, white communities. Here we see, uh, especially among juveniles, Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, uh, especially Samoans, and Filipino uh, Hawaiians are among juveniles about 62% of the arrests whereas they, they represent you know, half of that in the population. So that disparate impact, we're not seeing them being incarcerated for that, but what we're seeing is that they're, they're being criminalized. They have a criminal a record, record yes. and that has any manner of repercussions in terms of you know, getting the rest a job of their life. Yeah, the for rest the rest of, of their lives. Mm -hmm. When you fill out a stu federal student loan application, the last question they ask is, do you have any offenses under the Controlled Substances Act of the federal government or your state? Yeah. So, and if you lie on that, you're in big trouble. So they have to be honest, and then they don't get the loan. Of course. Yeah. So we continue to see that. You know, the fact that we don't incarcerate people for cannabis, uh, that's a small step that's happened over time because we're criminalizing so many other people. That was a priority they decided to change but we're still criminalizing the people and ruining their lives. So that's why we need to decriminalize cannabis yes. possession and legalize it. So tell me then, local, locally, is it still criminalized? I guess for recreational use it is. Well, it's, yeah, exactly. If you don't have a medical uh, cannabis card, oh. so that's about 20,000 people, I think 19,000 are the latest figures from Department of Health, Anyone else in the state who has uh, any amount of cannabis is breaking the law. Oh. And um, it depends on the amount, but the, the smaller amounts we're talking about are petty misdemeanors. So we're talking about a, a potentially a minimal prison sentence, which doesn't happen in practice, but a, but a fine, and again, a criminal record, which is very which detrimental. stays with you, yes. Exactly. So let's, let's talk about this industry. When we look at at uh, California and uh, Colorado had its boom. The industry is huge. We could use something other than tourism. You know, it's nice to have tourists, but, but tourists use water, electricity, cars on the road, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm where if we had another industry here that local people can work in, where we can, uh, our cost of living is so high because we have all of this extra stuff. If we had an industry, hemp, cannabis, I mean, if we look at hemp alone, 
the possibilities of what you can make from hemp. Um, when you grow hemp, the industrial hemp, mm -hmm. you can have jet fuel, you can have fabrics, you can have medicine. You, there's so many things. How do, how do we go from just this conversation into having a real industry? I think, I think it's an excellent point, and I think Hawaii is poised to both grow hemp on a large scale and uh, also cannabis. Right now, the cannabis uh, growth for the medical uh, cannabis programs is very regulated. It's limited to these eight licensees that won this uh, bidding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it basically cut out a lot of the other actors uh, who could have been growing. A lot of other states have systems where you have one person selling, one person growing, one person making products, et cetera, et cetera. That creates a lot of jobs. Yes. And um, I think we, you know, the state decided to go for one model, but I think as we move forward, we need to consider uh, involving more, more members of the community in this industry, yes. especially when we go for the uh, recreational, the adult use. And I think the lessons we've seen from other states, um, California has, is just getting started. So they, they have, they just passed the referendum last year and the uh, adult uh, recreational industry hasn't really started, but it's happening. Um, one of the great things that California did was that they're trying to involve the very people that were, are impacted by the war on drugs, the communities of color. They're trying to make sure that they aren't excluded from the industry, whether it's because they have a criminal record or any, for any other reason. So unfortunately, our state has some prohibitions on people with prior convictions being involved in the industry. And to me, that's incredibly sad that on the one hand, we want to legalize these things. But then we say, well, if you were in the past were convicted of an offense that now is legal, we will exclude you because of your past. And I think the model going forward is to involve the impacted communities as much as possible. And then also to have this more diverse system where you have different growers, uh, producers, retailers. And that's what we need to, to think of. Yeah. And back to hemp, when we look at places like Molokai, Maui, Maui lost the last sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Big Island just shipped wood from trees to, to Korea. Imagine all those trees when if they were growing hemp, they could sh ship to Korea and we wouldn't cut down trees. Nuts. So I'm saying there's, there's the possibilities of, of real industries. Mm -hmm. no, to make absolutely. fabrics, to to do all of these things that that this plant can do. Again, I think um, the state has been moving um, a bit too cautiously here. We currently have a research project of, and affiliated with the University of Hawaii that is looking at the hemp possibilities, and there's a uh, this pilot project happening. Um, that's out of concern again for federal law. Well, but you know, at it, some point when we created the medical cannabis program in 2000, that didn't stop us. Mm -hmm. We basically said this has medicinal use, and we will let people grow. So I think, given what you said about all the uses of hemp, no one denies that, and the fact that the plants that uh, the the strains that you use for hemp have have no uh, hallucinogenic right, properties. Right. It does seem very odd to be so cautious, when it, especially given our local economy. And I think we have, on that issue, uh, a lot of legislators are actively looking at that. And they do push for these bills, but um, leadership is cautious and sort of holds them back. But I hope we can make progress on that. Because when you look at the polluted area at Barber's Point, what used to belong to the Navy, and the Navy walked away and left it if you grew hemp, it would clean the land, and then you could use the hemp for something else. 
There's nothing. Okay, if I grow hemp, then what am I going to do with it? How do I sell it? Who do I sell it to? What certainly we should have all kinds of industries around this. It just makes no sense. No, and I think, I think we need to be able to um, walk and chew gum at the same time. I think what we've been seeing recently is, oh, we gotta wait for the medical cannabis system to be up and running and make sure that's perfect. Then maybe we'll do hemp. Then maybe we'll do recreational cannabis. I think that we need to start right now and look at what other states have been doing. I think you know the data is coming in. You know we, we were one of the first states to do medical cannabis. We provided the data to other states that then followed us, mm -hmm. proving we were right. When it comes to recreational, we are seeing data and we should follow it. We're seeing that it does not have a negative impact on crime does not have a negative impact on children's education, does not have a negative impact on driving. All these myths that were put out there are simply not borne out by data from the states involved and the federal government. So the recreational uh, experiment is ongoing and we are lagging behind. Yeah, I, I read that, that no one has ever uh, been died Correct. from medical marijuana that's exactly that and how many people die from alcohol from tobacco all of which are legal it's it's that you can even put those together and sadly you know we have this theory out there that cannabis is a gateway to those more dangerous substances where the reality is that cannabis is an alternative to treat ailments pain and it's being shown to be an exit substance for people who are taking prescription painkillers at risk of overdosing on them very yeah. much so and instead they could be using cannabis which is less risky and no risk of overdosing wonderful wow there's so much so much to 10,000 years of course is a long time <laughs> there's so much we have to learn which is why we're doing the program, this whole year, 10,000 years. There's so much to learn. So I'm asking you if you will come back, spend some more time with us, because like I said, we're just getting started. There's a lot to learn. I'd love to. Thank you so much. And thank you for being our guest and this 10,000 years. And we'll see you next week. Aloha. <laughs>